Welcome to Rodera. Today we are talking with Brian Bloom, the author and the journalist based in Jerusalem, Israel, and author of the book Total, the billion dollar crash of the company that took on big auto, big oil, and the world. Welcome to Rodera. Thank you, Manisha. Nice to be here. Thank you very much for this fascinating account and fascinating book on electric car and its founder. Tell us a little bit more about what the book is focused on or what the central theme of the book. Sure. So in 2007, an entrepreneur named Shai Agassi decided that he was going to get the world off of oil, that he had a solution for weaning the world off of gasoline-powered cars, and that solution was an electric car, but not just an electric car, but an electric car with a switchable battery. Now, what's so important about a switchable battery? Most electric cars today, actually all electric cars, whether it's the Tesla or the Chevy Bolt or the BMWs or the VWs, they all have a permanent battery, which means that when they reach the end of their range, the car needs to be recharged. And that range traditionally was about 100 miles at most. Now, the latest Teslas can get up to 300, 400 miles on a good day. And I say that on purpose because if you're using the air conditioning or you're using the heat because it's the winter, your mileage may go way down, your range may go down. So all of the cars that existed in the past and today suffer from a limitation in range. And Shayagasi said that is something that customers will not accept. They want a car that is just like a gasoline-powered car that can go anywhere and is not limited. And so the idea was the battery would not be a part what the customer bought when they bought the car. They would get the car, but Better Place, the company, would own the battery. And then Better Place built a network of switch stations in Israel. And I should mention that this started in Israel. They built a network of 40 switch stations around the country. And when your battery was running out of juice, you would pull into the switch station. It was completely automated. It looks like a car wash. Push your car up on a little bit of an incline. A robotic pallet would come in from the right, go underneath your car. Screws would unscrew automatically using software. The battery would come out, plop onto the pallet. The pallet would take it back into the station, and then it would come back with a brand new, fresh recharged battery, push it back into the car, automatically screw it back, and off you would go for another 100 miles with a new battery all in five minutes. And in that way, the better place concept was you could drive anywhere in the country without worrying about the range. So what I do in the book is I try to tell the story of this company. The range anxiety and finding a car that people can afford, those were the two noble missions of Shea Agassi. They are perfectly good, grand vision, a good vision to have. And obviously, implementation is always the foe of many entrepreneurs and it's hard for them. So the book starts with the vision, it starts with the problem and how one individual who is visionary and had certain resources tried to change the world in his own way. Yeah, exactly. The company had very, very big ambitions, and that is the nature of the entrepreneur, anybody who wants to play in the innovation game. In 2007, the end of the year, the company raised $200 million. It was called at the time the fifth largest Series A fundraising round in the history of technology companies. It then went on to raise almost a billion dollars. That came actually around $850 million, but it's nice to say almost a billion has that nice billion B, popping B there. In the course of raising the money, they built the company out. They hired about a thousand people. They contracted with Renault, the French car maker, to build the cars while Better Place then built 40 of its battery switching stations around the country. But somewhere along the way, things started to go wrong. Now, the public didn't know that. The public saw the switch stations going up. They saw the electric car prototypes running around. Better Place built this amazing visitor center near the city of Herzliya, which is north of Tel Aviv. And 80,000 people came to the visitor center over the course of several years. There were celebrities, Bar Raffaele, the model, and who was married, who was a girlfriend at the time to Leonardo DiCaprio. Demi Moore and Ashton Kutcher came. There were politicians. It was constantly packed. People were excited. But behind the scenes, things were not going well. There was infighting. There were technology problems. There was a lot of overspending on things that I can tell you about as we talk some more. And 
very soon after the car went on sale, it became apparent internally that the company was running out of money. Even though it had raised so much money, there was not enough to keep it going. And all kinds of things started to happen at that point. The CEO, Shia Gassi, was fired. The company received a last minute injection of $100 million, which gave it another six months. But eventually the company went bankrupt and the entire dream collapsed. Yeah, you, sometimes you live young and die young. Yeah, really. But let's dial back. There's a lot of rich history in this book, and there's a lot of details that we I would like to cover. First of all, Shea Agassi, who was he? What was he driven by? And how did he come up with this idea? Great question. Shea Agassi was, let me think about that. I think he was 39 when he started Better Place. Before that, he was what we call a technology wonder kid, graduated high school very early at age 16. He went on to study at the Technion, which is Israel's MIT, they're the highest technology university in the country. He went to serve on, serve in an elite technology computer unit in the army. And when he got out, he started a company actually with his father. The company grew, the company had some crashes and then it grew again. They had a deal with Apple. Eventually, they built an early internet, intranet kind of learning portal system that attracted the attention of SAP, the German software giant. And SAP bought this company. It was called Quicksoft. And Shaigasi then became a senior executive at SAP. Within a very short time, he was on a fast track to becoming the company's CEO. At the same time, however, he was invited to become part of a group called the Forum of Young Global Leaders. This is part of the World Economic Forum that meets every year in Davos, Switzerland. And as part of this group, they were asked in the particular year that he was a part of to come up with ideas and ways to make the world a better place. So they divided into groups. Some looked at healthcare, some looked at sustainable energy, some looked at pollution. Shai Ghazi teamed up with another young global leader, a guy named Andre Tsarur, and they started to explore ways to get the world off gasoline. And they explored hydrogen-powered cars. They explored all methane-powered cars. And finally, they realized that really only electric cars would provide the scalable solution, the affordable solution, and something that could really rid the world of the scourge of oil and pollution. And Shai Gassi shocked the world in, in 2007 by quitting his job at SAP even though everybody said he was on his way to being the CEO. Nobody knew what he was doing. And then he established Better Place. And it took off like a rocket. So Better Place was the name of the company that he came up with. And he focused on building something that he thought that the world needed. And also the world will change. And, or rather, the world will benefit from it. Because you're a cheaper car. You're also less dependent on oil. And also you're not destroying or hurt or damaging the environment. So all those positive things came in. And also, he was from Israel, so it helps having another way of transportation that is not dependent on oil because Israel is surrounded by enemies who sell lots of oil. Right. Israel is what we would call an island country, even though it's not an island. It's surrounded on all sides by other countries that don't allow Israeli drivers to continue past the border. And on two sides, there are enemy countries. That would be Syria and Lebanon. On two, on the eastern and southern side, you have Egypt and Jordan, with which Israel has peace treaties. But you can't go for a, a three-day road trip like you can in the United States, for example. You're limited to a relatively small area, about the size of the state of New Jersey in the U.S. So it was a perfect place to do a case study where you could put about 40 of these switch stations around the country. You could cover everywhere and you wouldn't have to cover all of the United States or all of an enormous state like California. So Shai's initial thinking was when he launched the car, electric car project, was not to actually build the car, but make money by selling the switchable batteries and service stations, uh, related services. It was more of a concept like razor and blade, and if you give away the razor or a cheaper razor, then the blades will make up in the long run. Right. They actually compared it with, uh, with a cell phone model. The idea was you buy your cell phone for a certain amount, but you have to pay for the minutes every month or the subscription plan every month. So... The better place model was you would buy the car, but of course you wouldn't have the battery. The battery would be owned by a better place. And then you would pay 
about $150 to $200 a month. And that would give you all the electricity that you needed, either charging at a charge spot at home. Everybody needed to have their own home charge spots so that they could charge up. And that's the way that most of the charging was done by you know, plugging in overnight and in the morning you were charged up. But if you needed to switch batteries at any point, that was included in your monthly subscription fee as well. Okay, okay. So he was not like Elon Musk that I'll go and build a sexy car and then I'll also have a good battery for you, but you buy a car from me that is designed by me, by my own company. But he was more focused on helping you to get electric juice or the charge that keeps you running. Exactly. Better Place was an infrastructure company. They built out the infrastructure to deliver the electricity to your cars. Now, it happened that in Israel, there were no other electric car companies and no charge spots at the time. In the United States at that point in 2007, 2008, 2009, you began to see charge spots from, from other vendors. But Israel was the only one. So they were, they were the, the sole infrastructure that was going to power electric cars whether it was from Better Place or Tesla or Chevy or Nissan down the road. Now, it happened that Better Place wound up becoming an importer. They wound up becoming the importer of the car that they ran on the Better Place network from Renault, and they sold it from the Better Place Visitor Center. But that wasn't really the model. The model was build the infrastructure, sell the electricity, and make money that way. So... If I extend that argument more and more, essentially it would be beneficial to better place the company and of course Shai is that line up every auto manufacturer you can and make sure that every country and every automaker has that switchable technology option or some kind of way so that they would actually use his switchable battery rather than create their own battery. Correct. Although better place didn't make the batteries. The actual batteries they used were built by Renault. And I suppose they could have used a battery from the Gigafactory from Tesla as well. But the idea was that many manufacturers would build cars that would have their batteries switchable and the better place would build the infrastructure to switch those batteries. Now, what happened along the way is that car manufacturers are very conservative. Mm -hmm. They're not so interested in trying something brand new. So when Better Place and Chayagasi went to the different manufacturers, Pretty much all of them said no. They went to General Motors. They said no. They went to Toyota. They said no. When they got to Renault, Renault said yes. And Renault said yes because its CEO, Carlos Ghosn, was interested in doing something innovative. He didn't have an electric car in development other than the Nissan Leaf that Renault owns Nissan. But Renault itself didn't have electric cars. It didn't even have any hybrids. Of course, you know, the Prius is a popular hybrid. Carlos Ghosn didn't think the Prius was a, a good solution. He made a joke. He said, a Prius is like a mermaid. When you want a fish, you get a girl. And when you want a girl, you get a fish. So Renault didn't have anything in the pipeline and saw a better place as a way to jumpstart its electric car differentiation. And that's a main reason that Renault jumped on board. But the plan was for many manufacturers to come on board. I think the other manufacturers were all waiting to see whether or not Renault succeeded and whether or not Better Place succeeded before they jumped on board. Yeah, fascinating in many ways. It sounds more like a Google Android system that every cell manufacturers would, cell phone manufacturer would use their operating system Android. And that means Google has to literally give away that technology to all of them to make it dependent. And then they found a way to make money. Obviously, it didn't work out that way in this industry. Right, because it's a little bit, I mean, I can't say that the cell phone industry is so much lower cost because it costs a lot to develop mobile phones and distribute them and whatnot. But Google was already a giant earning money from selling Google ads. Correct. So they had enough money to essentially seed Android at a low cost to all these different manufacturers. In the case of Better Place, the batteries themselves cost $15,000 per battery. And this was a brand new company with no revenue. So there was really no way to seed it. In fact, the batteries were supposed to be financed in the same way that mortgages were financed up until, well, still are, but up until 2008 in the United States when the housing industry collapsed. The idea was that you would take a whole bunch of different mortgages, you would bundle them up together, sell them to investors, 
and the investors would then make money every month on the interest from the mortgage. So the same idea was at Better Place. They would bundle up all the subscribers that they got, and that way they could finance purchasing the batteries, and they wouldn't have to pay the $15,000 the battery cost. But of course, by the time Better Place came out, the housing crisis hit, and no one wanted to play this game with the mortgage bundle up model, especially with batteries, which were a brand new concept. Hmm. And so Better Place wound up having to pay the full $15,000 per battery, minus discount that Renault gave them. Renault financed part of it, but no one on the outside came in. So Chai, visionary person with a great vision and support of politicians in the U.S. and Bill Clinton and also Shimon Perez in Israel, gets blessed by this great vision, attracts some very successful, large, wealthy investors in the first round, as you mentioned, the $200 million, but somehow drinks his own Kool-Aid, does not really get into the nitty-gritty of running a company, hiring the right people, focusing on the cost, and when the costs are deviating from actual production or distribution or build-up costs, he just disappears and goes into another direction. Tell us how all that led to an eventual destruction of the company, but the great it's good to start with great vision, but you need a solid implementation plan and the team behind it. Absolutely, absolutely. The first team that you hire is not necessarily the best team for the company long term. There were a lot of really talented and excited individuals who started with the company. For example, the guy who headed up the Automotive Alliances team, a very smart man named Sidney Goodman. He had no experience in cars. He was a software guy. The same was the case with the head of the infrastructure group. He was also a software guy. He also happened to be Shai Gassi's brother. The head of marketing was Shai Gassi's sister. Now, all of these people, I have nothing bad to say about them. They're all talented individuals, hardworking, dedicated, really to the vision. But as companies grow, they usually replace their initial teams with people who have more experience. Even the CEO is often replaced. You know, Manish, I was a CEO of a company. I started it before I was a journalist. I was a high tech entrepreneur myself. I started a company in 1998. We raised about $3 million. So nothing like better place. And they replaced me. I participated in replacing myself with a more experienced CEO, but that didn't happen at better place. The original team stayed on board. So that hurt the company's ability to move forward, I think, not having the right people in place. Also, the other thing, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. The other thing that I think is really important is looking at how a company evolved. When a company starts, and again, I know this from my own experience, and you probably know this as well, starting a company, companies have to create a business plan at the beginning, and you have to make a lot of assumptions because you don't know how it's going to go because you haven't built the company yet and you haven't sold any products. So you assume you can charge a certain amount and you assume there'll be certain buyers and you assume costs will be X, Y, and Z. When you start to move forward, everything becomes updated and you start to see what the real costs are, what the real interest is. What I think really was the demise of Better Place is that they didn't flow with the changes. So as things started to change and quite rapidly and quite quite dramatically, in, especially in terms of costs and assumptions, Better Place stayed the course. Shai Gassi didn't want to switch to a new direction. He didn't want to pivot. So let me tell you just a couple of these examples of things that changed that were very, very important. So people expected that the cost of the car that Better Place was selling with the switchable battery was going to be affordable, low cost. At some point, people even heard it was going to be free. So they expected a low cost car. But when the car was actually announced, the price was nearly $35,000. Now, that doesn't sound like an affordable car to me. And there were no rebates or credits like you have, again, in the United States here in Israel. That was the price. So consumers looked at that and they said, hey, you've tricked us. We expected a car for $10,000 or free, not $35,000, and they rebelled. They didn't buy the car, and Better Place got a lot of bad feelings at that point. What was excitement and support turned to, they're trying to cheat us. They're greedy. They want money. The truth was, it wasn't even Better Place's fault. The price wasn't set by Better Place. The price was set by Renault. Renault looked at the business and said, hmm. We have an order to build a 100,000 car 
our research and development budget is X or Y. So based on this and based on comparable vehicles in the market, we think the price of the car should be Z. And that's what they told Better Place. Better Place argued and said, no, no, no. With that high price, we'll never be able to live up to our promise. We'll never make any money. Our margin will be too small when we resell the cars. But they didn't win that argument. And the price came out to be very high. And that's an example where you now have a new business. Your assumption has changed. What do you do with it? Do you continue to sell the car at the price that you now have? Or do you think of a different way? Absolutely. And it gets more complex. Once the business original premise falls apart, you have to come up with a new business model. Now you're dealing with shareholders. You're dealing with irate customers. You're dealing with distributors, people with whom you have made commitments, partnerships. The whole has to be rejected. Yeah, there's just a lot of complications and issues that everybody is now getting bent out of shape, as we would say, they use the idiom. And let me give you an example of how Better Place could have pivoted that might have helped save the company, but it would have been shocking. For example, maybe the company should have pulled out of Israel entirely, even though they had invested in these 40 switch stations and they had all this hype and they had brought cars over. If people weren't buying the cars... And if the cost of selling the cars was so high, there was no margin. And in fact, the cost of the monthly subscriptions, you know, the cell phone model, didn't cover the cost of all the internal costs at Better Place, the installation of the charge spots. You wound up losing money on every car you sold. So that doesn't seem like a good business model. You sell more cars, you lose more money. What could Better Place have done entirely differently? They could have pulled out of Israel and said, okay, it's not working here. People don't want it. Let's move to China. We've got, you know, $100 million left in the bank. We're going to switch our entire focus to China. And they had partnerships that were happening in China. It would have been shocking to the Israelis. There would have probably even been lawsuits. How can you do this? But they might not have collapsed. That's an example of very extreme pivot. But I think it could have saved better place. But again, we're talking from hindsight, from, you know, a few years later. Who knows? I hate judging a company based on 2020 vision. Just to kind of give a proper context to our listeners. So the company was started in 2008. It really met its eventual death in 2013. But at the start of the 2008, Shai Agassi was going around and making promises. By 2011, we will have a car that is out there. By 2012, we would have sold 100,000 cars with switchable electric batteries, but the actual number was only 1,500. It was a little bit different than that and a little bit better and a little bit worse. On okay. Okay. The original projections that was by 2012, they would have sold 14,000 cars. The 100,000 wouldn't come for a couple of years later. But by the end of 2012, they'd only sold about three or 400 cars. So on both ends, it's different, but no better. At that point, it was clear people weren't buying cars. And the total number of cars that were bought in Israel was just under 1,000 by the time the company went out of business. If I play a little bit of devil's advocate and take a little bit broader perspective, when Thomas Edison invented light bulb and then of course the telephones came about and Henry Ford had the first cars came out, they were not very popular. People did not want to have electric bulbs. People did not want to have the uh, telephone. They were not needed. Who needs a telephone? You know, if I needed to meet someone, I would just go and visit, visit him. I didn't need a telephone. I mean, there are lots and lots of entrepreneurs with new technology, which requires a quote-unquote disruption, do not always find immediate market. And especially when Kai had so much money in the bank, he could have just played out the waiting game, but I guess he was in a hurry. Well, no, I think the problem was that the company ran out of money. I mean, at the beginning of October, which was when Shai Agassi was fired, the internal audit committee predicted that they may have had as little as three weeks left of cash in the bank. So there was no room left to wait. They would have had to have kept their costs much, much lower along the way in order to stretch things out. And that would have been, by the way, another form of pivot. Another form of pivot would have been stay in Israel, but only build 10 switch stations and do a test between, you know, in the greater Tel Aviv area instead of all over the country. One of the complaints that people that I spoke to and I interviewed about 80 people for the book, investors, employees from Better Place, car drivers. And one of the complaints was they had stations in a lot, which is in the southernmost part of the country. And they had stations far up north in the Golan Heights area. But hardly any people had the cars there. Hardly any people went there at all. And 
by going so big, were they wasting either money or attention? And if they had focused smaller, could they have saved money? If they hadn't hired a thousand people, but maybe only 500 people, could they have stretched the money until the demand came? Again, questions we don't have a good answer to because that's not how it played out. But you make a good point. The original technology in many fields is not the one that people go for in the end. Exactly. And my view on that money aspect was that there were two points that I would like to make. And if you can clarify whether they make sense or not. Sometimes you think this is the market, but there may be segments or sub-segments of the market. They may find more interest in your products. I think somewhere I read that Japanese taxi companies were very interested in this kind of business because the cost of fuel in Japan is very high. And if you have taxi companies, you also have taxi stations. So then you don't need to build all these expensive network around the, around the whole country. You could just build in selective stations. So rather than going after consumer market, you can go after public transportation, taxi companies, and just make money that way first and then have a broader vision that now it is available to consumers as well, but with a profit. And you're absolutely right, Manish. That was a direction that Better Place was exploring. The company had actually launched its switch station technology in Yokohama, Japan. That was where the first switch station in the world was built as a demonstration. And then they went on to build a pilot project of switchable battery taxis in Tokyo. And what you had was a taxi that would pick up people. It couldn't get to Narita Airport, which is the international airport, but it could get to the closer domestic airport. There was a battery switch station right in the Roppongi area, which is a very fashionable central area of Tokyo. And they didn't need to build charge spots and multiple switch stations. They just needed that one in Roppongi. They had four vehicles going around Tokyo. People loved it. And that's a potential way that the company could have grown. In fact, as the company, as Better Place was finally falling apart, they had a, another demonstration taxi system working in the Netherlands. They had taxis going between Schiphol Airport in the Netherlands into Amsterdam and back. So that was definitely a possibility. But again, that's not where the main focus of the company was. So originally started out in Israel, and as I'm just restracing the history of the company, and the international plan included uh, U.S., Australia, as you said, uh, Denmark also, and also there were talks about working with every country where they could, but initially they first focused on these countries, and that may have been the stretch of resources. Yes, absolutely. If you open up offices, all of these different countries, and not just open up offices in these different countries, but but send people on airplanes to meet with whoever might show an interest. So there was an office and infrastructure built in Denmark and the Netherlands, but there were people meeting with executives and interested utilities in Austria, Spain, Portugal, Germany. There were people that came from South and Central America to Better Place expressing interest in bringing it to Chile. They were constantly trying to open up the American market. They actually built out a whole office in Hawaii. All of this takes, it takes money, but more importantly, it takes attention. How many places can you really focus on at once? And how many places can you do really well at once? Do you need an office in France, on the Champs de Lézis, the, uh, the most expensive street in the entire city of Paris, when you don't have any customers in France and you don't have any cars or any switch stations. But you hope that at some point there will be. So it's kind of like, I believe it will be there. If I build it, they will come. Yes, in many ways, I guess early on when Shai raised so much money, that may have been led to his demise in the short run, simply because he thought he could get any money he wanted and never had the fiscal discipline, financial discipline, to really focus on cost, focus on delivering product that people wanted, and focused on having, at least in the near future, some profitable business model. Because if financiers are not willing to lend you or give you the capital, your vision just remains that. But on the flip side, and this is asked many times, and in fact, the CEO who was came after Shai asked this very question. If we don't think big, will anyone give us any money? Correct. So, Correct. so you have to say, if we're just in Israel and we do a small pilot test, could we raise enough money to go global? In fact, when the board of directors, you know, about six months before the company went out of business, the board of directors raised the question, should we close down 
Danish office? Should we close down the office they had in Australia? Close down the U.S. office. And the new CEO, a very smart man named Evan Thornley, who was the former CEO of LookSmart, which in the early days of the internet search business was a competitor to Google and Yahoo. Based in Australia. Exactly. And he was Australian. He was then tapped to replace Shai Agassi, flew to Israel, and took over the job right after Shai was fired in October of 2012. And he said to the board, if you shut down all these places, I will not be able to raise money. I can't do it. And they had a lot of different fights. After he was fired, things didn't go well. He disagreed with the board. They did close down or make plans to close down Australia and some of those offices and focus on Israel. So they realized that with a limited amount of money, they couldn't go global. But he said, and I tend to agree with him, that they couldn't raise more money or at least the money they needed unless they went global. It's a terrible catch-22. How would you respond to this cynical perception that I have after I read the book? Is that when you hatch a plan with a bunch of politicians in Davos, you are destined to respond to their needs, but not the needs of the market. Politicians come from regulations. They don't come from the market. And you being an entrepreneur, your first and only responsibility should be listen to the customers, uh, which they did not have any. Well, that, that's really the point. I was going to say there were no customers. It's kind of like Apple inventing the iPhone or Maybe let's not look at the iPhone. The iPhone people really wanted. There was a desire for a mobile smartphone that preceded the iPhone for many years. People say, what is iPhone? Not with the iPhone. But when the iPad came out, it was panned. Do you remember this? Yeah. The journalist and the technology pundits said, who needs a tablet? So with an electric car like this, many people said, who needs an electric car? Or who needs a, a switchable battery electric car? We just don't know. So Shai Agassi, like Steve Jobs said, I know. I'm going to take a chance on my vision that people will want this iPad, that people will want these switchable battery cars. There was no market to test. There was no experience. There was no existing sales. In many ways, I think his experience as a management consultant and then being a salesman, quote-unquote, or a consultant for SAP, never really prepared him to run a company at a at nitty-gritty level when you don't have resources. It's another thing to have a resources of SAP, and you can blow the money, you can have a quarter or two of problems, but you can recover even though you stumble. But in these cases, you stumble, you're done. I think Better Place stumbled in part because it had a vision of not making the same mistakes as some Internet companies. I'll give you a great example, the example of Twitter. So when Twitter first came out, it was almost a homegrown system built by some engineers who had come out of the company Blogger, and then they started a podcast company called Odeo, and Twitter was like a side project, which was the one that took off, but it was not very robust. The back end wasn't particularly deep, and people, people loved it, and they started tweeting, and they started using it. And the Twitter system kept failing. In fact, they had this cute little graphic of a whale being carried up to heaven by little birds, Twitter birds. They were holding it up on strings. And they called that the fail whale because that's when the system crashed and failed. <laughs> and this happened over and over in the early days of Twitter. When Michael Jackson died, the system crashed. During the Macworld Expo, one of the, when Twitter was first getting started, it crashed because too many people were tweeting. And Shai Ghazi and Better Place said, we can't afford to have a network of cars crash. If our system goes down, people won't know where they're going. The GPS will go down. They will run out of electricity because it won't tell them how much charge they have or where the nearest charge spot or switching station is. We can't afford to become like Twitter. So they built out the back end in order to support a million drivers, not the thousand drivers they had, but the future belief that there would be a million drivers around the world. It wasn't even built in Israel where the drivers and where the uh, initial switch stations were being built. It was put in a server farm in Madrid, Spain. Now that cost a lot of money. If you're running a server farm for a million subscribers, you've got to you know, pay for all those servers. You've mm -hmm. got to pay for IBM to manage them. You've got to pay... You know, the air conditioning and the infrastructure, that cost money that wasn't there. And that's part of what started to use up the money faster than they had it. Even if they raised all this money, 
the attitude of the company was we've got to be big up front so that we don't go the way of Twitter. But that used up the money too fast. Have I said catch 22? I'm going to say it again. <laughs> In the end, the better place ended up becoming bitter place. Or the joke is, did it go to a better place? Um, <laughs> to a better place. Well, there's a very, I have to tell you this one quick story. Sorry to interrupt, but there's a, um, the Jerusalem Post wrote an article about the book and about me. And unbeknownst to me, they took a picture of one of the old switch stations, which is shut down now. And the lot for where the switch station was is now selling, believe it or not, tombstones. Oh. And the sign, Better Place, is right next to the tombstones. Unbelievable. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. In the end, with all these 800 plus $850 million that were raised and invested and spent, did company achieve anything of any substance that could teach us in some sense? Uh, technologically, they built that Oscar navigation system that was, as one of the board members commented, we spent $60 million to create something that sells for twenty nine ninety five. But the people who built the Oscar system went on, a whole team of them went on to General Motors, where they worked on the OnStar system and made that even better. So, And they're still based in Israel. So you can say that technology is transferred to another company. This happens all the time in technology. And that's a good thing. Companies fail, but the smarts and the technology and the brains behind them go on to other companies and build even better systems after that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I would say that the most important thing we learn from the Better Place experience is not the technology, but actually the thing that Better Place didn't have at the beginning, which was customer experience. So if Better Place didn't know what customers would want from their electric cars in 2007, 2008, by 2013, they had learned what customers would stand for, what they would find inconvenient, what they would tolerate. And this is a lesson that has very big implications for every electric car company today, including Tesla. And I'm going to be as, so bold as to say Tesla will not become more than a niche it was the 400,000 cars that the Tesla Model 3 has reserved, the customers who say they want one of the Tesla Model 3s, 400,000 cars sounds like a lot, but compared to the millions of cars that are sold every year, it's a niche, and it's going to stay a niche. And the reason why is that people want a battery that will not require trade-offs. They don't want a battery that goes for, well, the better place model, 100 miles, in the Tesla model, 300 miles, they don't want a battery that is limited. They want a battery that will go a 1,000 miles. And if they're going to have to charge that battery, they don't want to pull into a fast charge station, sit for 30 to 40 minutes, and get an 80% charge. They want a five-minute charge. They want it to be just like a gasoline-powered car, pull into a gas station, fill up, five minutes later, you're on your way. When electric car batteries evolve into a technology that allows five-minute recharges or a thousand mile range, then you're going to see electric cars take off all over the world and there'll be no stopping them. And the thing that we learned from the Better Place countrywide case study, and I love to call it a countrywide case study, is that customers just don't want to stop and do something different. They want it to be like their gasoline power car. We learned that by doing this experiment. So now we know. Very fascinating. And you've written a wonderful book that many should read because there are so many things that learn from that people can learn from, which, which is regarding the how people behave, where the technology is taking us, where the energy and transportation entrepreneurship is all taking us together today. I think that it's important for, for potential readers of the book to keep in mind that it's not just for people who care about electric cars. I mean, if it was, I, you know, I'd have a few readers and that's about it. But it's really something that anyone who has been in business or who wants to be in business, whether it's an entrepreneur or a, an executive at a large company like Google or Apple or Facebook, there's lessons to be learned from the Better Place story that anybody can take back to make their business better and to make them smarter entrepreneurs. And really, that's what I'm trying to get across is that you can learn from failure. You can learn from success, absolutely, but sometimes you can learn even more from failure. Very well said. Very well said. Tell us a little bit more about you. 
how did you end up writing this book? What attracted you to this book uh, or this topic and what you had to endure and how long it took you to put this book together? Absolutely. So I am originally from the San Francisco Bay Area. I grew up in the United States and moved to Israel about 20 years ago. And as I said earlier, I work in the high tech world. Then I started writing about startups instead of starting them. And in the summer of 2012, which was right at the beginning of when Better Place was selling, starting to sell the car, we went into the visitor center. It was really kind of a summer trip. My family was looking for something to do. We'd been to the beach and we were, it was too hot to go on a hike and we didn't want to stay around the house. It was vacation time. And we said, how about we go to the visitor center and see this crazy electric car from Better Place? So we piled in the car, filled up our car, our old 20 year old Toyota Corolla, the one we had from the very first day we, we moved to Israel. We drove out to the center. We test drove the Better Place car. And we fell in love with it on the spot. My wife and I looked at each other and we said, we have to have this car. It wasn't what we intended to do. We just wanted to spend the day doing something different. We went and we started filling in paperwork. Two weeks later, we put that uh, down, down payment on or deposit on. And then we had the car. It was not our intention. So I owned the car. I loved the car. I truly found it exciting. It was powerful. It was clean. It was good for the environment. It was quiet. You don't hear anything at all when you're idling. There's no idle. It's just completely silent. And I really love this car. And when the company went out of business, which I didn't see coming, I asked myself, how did that happen? How did I not see that coming? I'm a journalist. And what I do is I research things. If I'm going to go on a vacation, I'm going to look at every possible destination, hotel, activity, rental car price. I'm going to research it so much that I'm going to spend more time on the research than the actual vacation. If I can <laughs> buy the same thing, if I'm going to buy a, a $50 portable hard drive, I'll probably spend five hours more, you know, if you add up my hourly rate, I spent far more on the research than I did buying the hard drive. I didn't do any of my due diligence on this car. Now, I don't know if I would have found out about what was going on internally and that the company was running out of money, but I didn't do it. And I said, you know what? I'm going to do it now. I'm going to find out what happened. I put on my journalist hat. I started looking into it. I started speaking to people at Better Place. I got some good help from investors who introduced me to more people. And I discovered that the story was not only fascinating, but it was a story that if I didn't tell it, Nobody was going to tell it. If I didn't write about Better Place, it might have been forgotten. And that, I felt, was a shame. I didn't want that to happen. Fascinating. Thank you very much for your time and your comments. And I encourage people at all levels in entrepreneurship or in business or in technology or in energy or in automotive industry or infrastructure industry or those who are looking to expand the business internationally. Get a copy. Absolutely. And if I can give a shameless plug here, visit brianblum.com. That's B-R-I-A-N-B-L-U-M.com. You can read a free chapter. There's bonus content. There's articles. And of course, you can buy the book. Excellent. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Manish. It was a real pleasure. Thank you.